Jesus, help us this morning as we look into your word to hear from you, uh, Lord, and uh, I do pray that you would speak and uh, just use uh, the work that you've been doing in my life over the last couple of weeks and use it for your glory today in your name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Shane Fries, and uh, I am I do pastor out at Liberty Lake Church. Uh, I've known uh, Steve Jarman, and uh, for man, we've known the Jarmans. I don't know what it is, eleven, twelve years. I, I remember when some of the kids were tiny. Even the big kids were tiny. Like they were. I looked down at them, not up to them now. So, anyway, what a great time, and uh, it is a privilege to be here with you guys. I. Um, well, hope, hopefully I don't startle you um, with my sermon this week, uh, but I was uh, in the series on Mark, we're finishing up Mark, and I had a, a week where I was trying to prepare my sermon, uh, which was following in the path of our uh, series, and um, my life just kind of hit a really rough patch, and I want to share that with you this morning, uh, and um, hopefully it'll be meaningful to you uh, as it was for our church. And so... On Monday morning, my typical uh, work is uh, do office stuff, have meetings, and uh, kind of catch up from the week and, and just recalibrate. And Monday evening, as I was uh, sitting at home, I received a text. Uh, this was uh, about three weeks ago. Um, but I received a text that one of my, uh, one of the groomsmen in our wedding uh, from 26 years back and uh, was, had been a high school, one of my best friends in high school and, and going through the, our early college age experience and young married experience, um, had committed suicide unexpectedly. Um, he, things, he was in church and his bride with three kids and uh, went out camping and uh, didn't come back. And um, so that was Monday which, you know, I'm kind of a tough guy, and I'm like, all right, well, we can live with that. And uh, Tuesday night, as I was sitting at home, uh, wrapping up our evening, I got a text that another high school friend had committed suicide uh, that week as well. And so in two days, I found out about two friends who were right about my age had committed suicide. And uh, I'd actually recently been doing some study on suicide uh, and just the, the, what's happening in our culture and what's coming uh, with, with all of the lockdowns and, and all of the isolation, and they're anticipating a lot more of that. And so I'd been doing some research, and it actually told me that between the ages of, of about, somewhere about 45 to 65 is the highest uh, risk of suicide right now for men. And it's, it's, the, it's the one that they're anticipating being a great deal. Anyway, so all of that begins to happen. And I come to my sermon study on Wednesday afternoon, and I can't, like, I can't focus, and I can't get anything to work. Normally, you open your Bible, and you, you read verses, and you, it says this, and thus says I, and we on and on we go. And I could not put my head around that process. And, uh, and so as Thursday came and uh, my office administrator looked at me and said, hey, you know, kind of need your notes here pretty soon because uh, we're supposed to get it ready. And I went a completely different direction. And so what we're going to do this morning is I want to share with you the work that God did in my heart uh, in addressing some of the emotional uh, weight that I carried that week and some of the pain that I experienced, but also the hope and joy, I think, that comes out of us being the church. And so uh, open your Bibles, if you would, for me, uh, to Romans chapter 12. Uh, and, and how I got to this text, I was thinking to myself, how are we the church? How are we behaving as the church? Here, this good friend of mine, somebody that I would have said was a, was a really good friend. I was connected with him on Facebook. I'd been watching some of his projects. He was doing wood, wood projects. Turns out, I, I found out, this is how close of friends we were, I found out during his funeral that he had made a living making clothespins. He'd, he'd started making clothespins, and they were producing like 10,000 or 20,000 a day, these clothespins, and that he's making a living doing this. I had no idea. And, and so part of what really hit me was, uh, are we really friends? I mean, I've, I've known him since I was a kid. Are we really friends? 
I, I don't know anything about his life. I didn't, I didn't see any of the signs that, 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 were, that were, you know, possibly available to see as he started to move towards suicide. Um, and so in dealing with my own guilt and some of my own frustration, the verse that popped into my head was uh, that we should, um, you know, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so I, I went and opened up Romans 12, and I, I, as I was reading that passage, I, I read more of the context, and um, I believe God really challenged me in what it means to be the church in this particular situation. So uh, follow along with me in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, you know, as I, as I looked at that passage, it, obviously you can see some of the challenges that we have in there. And, and as I was wrestling just with trying to figure out what it means for me to be the church, was I a good friend to my friend? Were we really friends? Could I claim that? And so I started asking the question, does our church look any different? I mean, are we Facebook friends in church? Like, think about what that looks like for your own family here. Are, are you Facebook friends? You kind of know what's going on. You like some of the stuff that they're doing, but you really don't have to get involved in the mess. You really don't have to be close enough to deal with their junk. Oh, wait, you guys don't have any junk. I forgot you guys have Pastor Steve. I, I, I got this all wrong. I thought I was at my church for just a moment. I, the challenge that I had in my heart was, man, as I'm thinking about what it means to be friends with, my, with, you know, with Kevin, I, I, didn't, I didn't see any of the signs because I wasn't close enough to him. And now, listen, I'm, I'm not dealing with guilt on this. I, I'm not struggling in my own heart anymore, uh, partly because I realized that, that God's given me family to care for at Liberty Lake Church. And, and, and I have to be engaged in that relationship with people there. And that's, that's my heart. But do you know, as a pastor, it's kind of hard to do that sometimes. There's this tendency for pastors to hide away, to, to isolate themselves from people. I think because there's this idea that, that we're supposed to look like we have all, all of our lives together and that we don't have problems and our children are perfect. I mean, look at their perfect kids today. I'm so proud of you guys sitting in here listening to me. I got to tell you, my boys don't do that anymore. Well, they're adults and they don't actually come to our church, but um, they don't do that. So it's an amazing thing, though, when you think about how close we are, how much time do we spend invested in our relationship with each other? And so when you first see this text and you read verse 9, the very first thing we have is let love be genuine. And, and, and as we wrestle with what does that mean in the context of the church, what does it look like for us to be a church that genuinely loves one another? And how do we live in that reality? I, I've figured out in my own life that uh, I am really good at loving the things I love. You know what I mean by that, right? Right? Um, if I could, I, got a, um, I would wear a T-shirt that would say Ford on it. Not because I think Fords are better than everything else. That's not the case. Uh, some of you drive other cars, and that's okay. Um, it's because it's what I know. 
Uh, I've had Fords my whole life, and I know them, and I'm comfortable with them. I, I, know, I know what's probably going to go wrong with many of the models, because I've owned them, and it's gone wrong. And so I'm comfortable with that. And, and for some of you that, that like other vehicles or other, other, uh, uh, you know, other brands, you're like, well, yeah, because Fords, they have those problems. But the reality is, is that we, we, we stay with the stuff that we like. We stay with the, the things that we're familiar with. And when it comes to love, we, gen, we generally, uh, generally begin or it's find it easier to love things that we already kind of love. So guess who I love the most? Yes. That is true. You can ask my bride. I've been working on it for 26 years to put her first. I have. And it's my desire to do that. It's my, de my desire to put God first and to put my bride first. But what's easiest for me is to love myself. And so imagine in, in the context of a church, imagine if it's difficult for me to love my bride more than myself and I chose to, to, to love her. I, I find her very attractive. I'm excited to spend the rest of my life with her. Imagine how much more difficult it is for me to love you all with that kind of selfless love. That, that is a real high call that, that we actually hear from Paul here in Romans. Let love be genuine. Let it be real and authentic. Look at what 1 Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, verse 13 through 25. I was talking about this with our church the other day. Y'all need to get page flipping apps on your phone. I don't know how you could mute everything else and just turn up the page turning apps, but you know how sometimes it's nice to hear people flipping through their pages in their Bibles so you know they're looking for the passage? It's helpful for a pastor to know when he can start reading. If you don't hear anything, you're like, are they there? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with, pres with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, let one another earnestly, um, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower uh, of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Isn't it interesting that Peter talks about this idea of purifying ourselves, purifying our souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love? There's an important aspect of our faith as we consider what it means to be the church and to love one another. In fact, another, another passage in the, in the Bible tells us that we're known by our love for one another, that the world will recognize a difference in how we live by our love for one another. Aren't you guys glad that you have a, 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 an application process for who shows up at your church? You can like check off the box to say, well, hopefully they have these preferences and, and they like this particular style of food or this particular style of, uh, of entertainment and they drive these cars and this is their personality profile so I know I'll get along with them. Okay, that's a joke. <laughs> do you, guys, you guys don't have that application process, do you? It, we would, if we had our choice, we would do church that way, wouldn't we? We'd find the people that we're most comfortable with, and we'd say, oh, yeah, you come on in. I, I like hanging out with you. The problem is, if I had that kind of church, it'd be a very small group of people because they'd have to be okay with hanging out with me. And that's not always a large group. Genuine love looks different than that of the world. Genuine love, I think, looks different than what we're comfortable with and what we would tend to prefer. 
The love of Christ, the love that's, that is modeled in Scripture, is uncomfortable, it's dangerous, it's risky, and, and it's offered to people without requiring a return. And that's just tough to do. I'm telling you, it's tough to do. And yet it's what we're called to be as the church. It's exactly what called it, God has called us to do. And is, isn't it interesting that the, the challenge that he gives us is, is within our body first? I mean, are we going to love the world if we can't love one another in here? Are you? Probably not. Most likely not. I mean, you guys choose to meet once a week. Some of you more than that. If, you can't, if we can't learn to love one another within this context, how are we going to love the world who is dead set against the things that we actually hold as, as foundational values in our church and in our faith? And what a time, right? Have you ever seen, I, I don't remember a time where the Christian faith has been more uh, on trial, if you will, in every, it feels like it's in every segment of our culture. The foundations of Scripture are, are held as, as acts of hate. I don't remember a day where the church has been more uh, positioned for glorious spiritual impact than today. The second piece that he says, I love how Paul does this. Isn't Paul just gracious in his words? He starts off and he says, let love be genuine. Then, he, then what does he say? Abhor evil. Hate the things that are evil. He's just, he's just so gentle in his delivery of things. When you think about evil, though, when you think about hating what is evil, um, I love this, that if you actually go in and do a word study, you'll find other texts that pick this up. And Amos uh, chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says this. Somebody just turn and just make some noise in your paper book. I think you got some free Bibles in there. In, there you go. There we go. Now we're moving. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Amos chapter 5. In verse 14 says this. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. You have to remember in Amos, we're actually seeing one of the prophets come to Israel and call them out for their idolatry and their constant pursuit of other, other gods, their worship of everything but God, and their constant rebellion. And so here it is, Amos is actually challenging them to say, do what you say you're doing. Behave the way that you claim that you trust God. Did you see that in verse 14? He says, seek good and not evil that you may live so that the God or the Lord, the God of hosts will be with you as you have said. Here's Israel claiming to be people of God. They're claiming to be his chosen ones, but they're not living according to his standards. They're not following his law. And Amos, one of, his, one of God's prophets comes and says, you guys need to start acting like you say Start following God like you claim that you do, and maybe he will be gracious and kind and relent from what's coming. You know, I think the problem that we run into, and this is the challenge, right? Uh, if you've been married for very long, you know that you can find a way to fight over almost nothing. I mean, it, some, of, some of the arguments that we get into, my bride and I have gotten into, we realize as we got done, we're like, why are we even arguing about this? It makes no sense to lose the quality of our relationship over this small issue. We've had some big ones, too. I mean, all of us do. But it's amazing how quickly we can get our eyes off of what's actually happening or what's important in our marriage. And, and it, I don't know what it is about kids, but they seem to provide even greater opportunities for misunderstanding and conflict. They're amazing gifts from God. We call them opportunities for growth. But it's, how often is it that we lose context in relationship over something small? And, and, and I don't remember, I don't remember all, I won't share with you all the details. I remember some of them. But I remember one particular conflict for my bride and I. That it, was a, it was a small, just, just a, a couple of words that were said at the wrong time um, in, in relationship to her, her mom, and me. Now, why are you guys laughing already? You don't know what I did. And right there, you guys are assuming I'm the one that screwed this up. 
Well, it's true, but I, I really did. But, but the reality was there was a moment where my bride looked at me and said, stop, stop making me choose between you and her. And years later, I mean, as I look back at it now, I realize one of the things that was happening is we had our eyes on the wrong stuff. We were actually, we were mis, uh, uh, misreading who the enemy was in that setting, and it wasn't any, any one of us. It wasn't my bride, her mom, or me. There, there wasn't an enemy in the three of us. Where was our, the conflict was coming from miscommunication, and I, I believe uh, many, many times in the church, our eyes are on the wrong stuff. We, get, uh, we assign as enemies people that really aren't, and we lose sight of who really is. Ephesians tells us who that enemy is, right? You guys know this passage? Many of us do. Ephesians chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 10, uh, 6, verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, In verse 14, he starts off into the armor of God, and he says, stand therefore. Uh, our enemy in this world, it's not, it's not one another. You, it's way too often as we think about uh, relationship, when we think about conflict, when we think about loving one another as God's called us to love, uh, our focus gets onto the physical things and the earthly things, and we begin to have conflict within the context of our family, within the context of our church family, and our eyes get off of the real battle. We get, off, get our eyes off of the important things in life. My friend Kevin I went back and watched his Facebook feed after I found out that he'd passed, that he'd, that he'd taken his life. And I went back and I started watching his posts that I had seen and that I'd liked over the last uh, about three weeks. And, and going back and looking at it with, with the reality of where he was at in his life, I actually saw, I saw a change in his Facebook posts. I actually noticed it, finally. And I realized what was going on. Do you know what my focus had been all the, before all of that? Part of it was is that I wasn't one of his close friends anymore. I wasn't in his life at the time. I, we, were, we were separated by states. Um, you know, I, I've been, we've been separated by years, and I've been involved in ministry with a whole new family, ministry family, and, and uh, my boys are all adults and getting married. Actually, uh, nine weeks ago, we had our first grandson born. Uh, so I'm a grandpa, by the way. I, don't know, I know I don't look that old. Thank you. But uh, I'm actually a grandpa. And uh, but it was just amazing how much my focus was on everything else. And a ton of my time has been taken with COVID and, and, and politics and, and uh, all of the, the, the division that's going on within our own church over those issues. My the elders and I have spent hours and hours trying, wrestling through how to care for people who have polar opposite uh, uh, views on those things. And we've had, we've had families leave because we were wearing masks. We have families leave because leave we weren't wearing enough masks. Uh, we've just, our church has really had a, a, a lot of challenge with this. It's been very, very difficult over this last year for our church family. So here I was focused on all of those things. And my buddy Kevin's life, he, he's losing grip on, on any kind of hope and he kills himself. And so I go back and I look at his Facebook and I can see in it his whole focus turned from the good things that he had in his life to the horrible things that were going on in our culture. And all of his posts shifted from the, the pictures of his family camping and the projects that he was working on in his truck and his new wood project and they all shifted to political posts over and over and over again for, for a solid three weeks before he took his life. Now I saw those posts and as a good pastor, I don't say much about it because I'm trying not to exclude anybody in, my, in our ministry or, or isolate people. But I didn't recognize the change in his life because I wasn't watching very closely. I wasn't very close to him. One of the things that, that really grabbed me out of this text is that if we're really going to rejoice with people who rejoice and we're going to weep with those who weep, it means we have to enter into their mess. Genuine love engages in the mess of others' lives. And just so you guys know, that means it's messy. Do you know what messy is? 
You know what that word means? Any of you young kids ever have your parents ask you to clean your room? Come on, there's a few of you. Come on. Any of you old kids ever had your parents ask you to clean your room? Absolutely, right? You remember those days when it was a disaster? And if your mom, if you, if your mom was really gracious, she'd come in and help you reorganize. And you're like, how is that possible? How does it look like this? And then if within a few hours, it doesn't look that way anymore. That's a description of messy. That's an illustration of messy. The weirdest part is, isn't it crazy how you're okay with your own mess? Have you guys ever thought about that? You see that beautiful room and you're like, man, that is gorgeous. How did she do that? And then within a few hours, it's right back to where you're comfortable with your dirty clothes laying on the floor and toys laying out where you can see all. Maybe it's that we like to see all of the stuff that we own laying on the floor. Maybe that's what it is. We're just surveying our kingdom of dirty clothes. Look, I have so much stuff, I can leave dirty clothes out on the floor. I had four boys. We still have four boys, but we had four boys living in our room. One day, my bride posts a picture of a trash bag hanging on a doorknob and asks the question, anybody know what this means? (laughs) Some of you know what it means. My boys did not. And we worked for years. They were comfortable in their mess. And, and here's the problem is that when we come to the church, you guys, each one of us is comfortable in our own mess. And it's incredibly difficult to inter, inter, engage or interact with other people in their mess. Why? Because it's messy. But genuine love, Christ's love, engaged people in their mess. You see that all throughout the New Testament. In fact, he was accused of being a friend to sinners <laughs> and prostitutes and tax collectors. That was one of his accusations because the religious people of the day were too good to engage in the mess of the people. As we think about this text, there's so much more in here that we will not get to today. Uh, It's amazing to me how Paul is challenging his brothers and sisters, not to curse one another, to leave vengeance for the Lord, never repay evil for evil. And we have this whole context of you know, justifying our anger and, and making things right. And yet in the church, we're to look different than this. In the church, we are to be an example, a, a different role model. In fact, when we think about the church, it's not a building or a location. We are called to be the church. Wherever you are, you're still the church. Um, You you really can't come to church. Uh, You can gather with the church, but this building is not church. It's you and me together. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. And so when we engage with one another, when we love one another, when we, when we actually uh, invest in the mess of one another, the, the word of God is true and, and lives change and, and that reality begins uh, to affect others. And I realized as I was wrestling through, in fact, what, the craziest part about that whole week is that after uh, Tuesday when I found out that the two of my friends had died, we did the memorial service on Wednesday for my buddy Kevin online, which was just the weirdest thing ever. Um, and then I got a phone call from a pastor friend of mine who said, hey, do you remember so-and-so? Uh, you, um, you met him a couple of years ago, led him to, we got to, uh, he was um, led to the Lord and we got to celebrate and met with him for a few weeks in his new faith. He just committed suicide by, on Friday that week, that same week. And so here, th- that was the process of leading up to this sermon on, on this particular Sunday about three weeks ago. And the, the reality of how messy life is, how important the, the need of the church is to be actively engaged in genuinely loving one another and loving the world that's around us, abhorring what is evil and being the church in everything that we do was so profoundly hammered into my heart. I, I was really wrestling with even how I drive. Do I drive like a Christian? You are correct. I do not drive like a Christian. Thank you. One of the young men in here who's obviously seen me on the road. Have you guys ever thought about that? Would people be able to tell by the way I drive that I'm a believer? And I don't mean going five miles an hour below the speed limit. I'm a Christian. I do five over. 
I have an entirely legalistic way in which that's okay, right? When the law, if the police officers allow you to do it, they're the enforcers of the law, clearly, it's, the, it's okay. Now, for you teenagers, that's not true. Talk to your parents. But the reality is, is that if I actually evaluate my life, how I'm living every day, it's very difficult for me to say that I'm being the church in everything that I do. Now, when we talk about being in a close relationship with others, you guys, here's the reality. I really can only invest in a few lives. And, and I'm the pastor of our church, and there's people that would like me to be invested in their life, in every one of their lives. That's impossible. Well, the best I can do is have a very, very superficial relationship with a whole bunch of people. That's just the reality of, of relationship. You can't have deep, meaningful relationship with a lot of people. But if each one of us in the church commits to being engaged in two or three people's lives, we can suddenly have deep and meaningful relationships happening across the church. In fact, if we were to do that, I believe that we would be full up. We would be overflowing and actually begin to affect the neighborhoods and the people around us and how we love and how we care and how we genuinely address our faith in day-to-day -day living. I don't know if you've experienced great pain in your life. I don't know if you've experienced uh, the realities of, of somebody committing suicide or, or taking their life or that kind of isolation. My hope is that you don't, but the reality is, is that most of you at some point in your life probably will, according to the statistics that we're seeing. The reality is, is that the enemy is going to continue to deceive, and he's going to continue to grow in his effectiveness in deceiving the lost. Just as we close, I want to leave you with Jesus' commandment to his disciples in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify himself, him in himself, and glorify uh, him at once. Little children... Yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The challenge that I experienced in that one week period as God was wrestling with my heart was, Shane, are you being the church or are you just being a pastor of a church? Are you just fulfilling a role and, and therefore, therefore engaging in a few people's lives uh, just, just so that you can fulfill the role? Or are you genuinely loving people as I've called you to love them? Are you genuinely going to be the church? Not on Sunday, we all know this is easy, right? Come on, this is easy. Y'all know how you're supposed to behave. We all know what we're supposed to do on Sunday mornings. Everybody's respectful, and we all come in and say, praise the Lord, Jesus is good. Oh, I'm struggling in this one area, but things are great. But I, I mean Monday, Tuesday through Saturday, when life's tired and, and your job stinks and your kids are wonderful, and your spouse and you are communicating perfectly, and you have no family complications, and you, don't, and, you, and you feel sick, and somebody cuts you off on the road, all of those moments in life, are we being the church? And that's what I was wrestling with in my own heart. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not doing, I, I, I haven't fixed it. This sermon didn't fix it. I wish it did. I wish if, if I could figure out how to do that just to hit a reset button so everything would be right and you'd just be good from then, I would give it away for free. But it, it didn't fix it. But it's made me much, much, much more aware of what that attitude is 
what that heart moment is when I'm choosing myself, when I'm choosing selfishness, and I'm choosing to love me more than I am choosing to love God and to love others and to follow him in obedience. My heart was, when, when this hit, I was talking to Cyril and Steve, and they, I knew that I was preaching here with you guys a, a few weeks back, and um, when this sermon hit, it really grabbed my heart, and I thought, man, I need to share this with more people. I need to share this with others, because I think this is an important part of what it means to be the church. And we're going to deal with suicide. We're going to deal with the selfishness of the world. We're going to deal with the selfishness of our own heart. The, the farther and farther away from God our world moves, the more exposed the Christian heart will be. And we're going to have to make a choice. Who are we going to follow? Who are we going to serve? Are we, going to, are we just going to hide and look like the world and pretend to be Christians? Or are we going to choose to love and live as the church, which will be different and it'll be exposed and you won't be able to hide it? <sighs> I'd really like the easy life. I like my mess. Just being honest. And I don't think that's, what, that's not what God's called us to do. It's not what he's called us into in relationship. It has been such a joy for me to be here. I, I hope you guys know um, it is a gift for my bride to come and worship with you guys and to hear you sing. Uh, we pray for you. I pray for Steve and, and my bride and I pray for, for, for their family and you guys on a regular basis because we feel like we're part of your family, even though we hardly ever see you. Uh, that sounds really weird. It's probably just a church thing. Um, but we feel like we're part of your family and it is just a gift to come and sing and, and worship with you this morning. That really, it really filled my heart um, to hear y'all sing and, and to be part of that process and to get to share my heart with you. So would you pray uh, with me as I close? And I, I really wanna challenge you to pray this prayer for yourself. God, am I being the church? Is that who I am or am I just going to church? Am I just pretending to be a person of faith. Would you take a moment and just, you wrestle with the Lord on that and then I'll close us in prayer here in just a moment. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I am convinced that you have done so much more than what we could ever think, hope, or imagine. And yet, God, I admit that my eyes get so easily distracted. I get, I get swayed by the, the cares of this world, by the concerns of money and, and uh, issues in life, relationship, and all of those things. And Lord, my eyes have been distracted by, by politics and, and COVID and medical stuff and, and all of the things that are happening even to the point, Lord, where you know my heart um, and I've had to confess um, words and thoughts that were dishonoring to you uh, regarding politicians and, and, and um, even family members in our church that hold uh, starkly contrasting views to mine. So God, we desperately need your help to know how to be the church. I need your help to be able to love people with a genuine love, the love of Christ, as, as you challenged us to, loot, to do, Lord Jesus, to love one another as you have loved us. As you put yourself on the cross and you died for those who did not love you. The word says that we, while we were still weak and sinners and his enemy, Lord Jesus Christ, you died for me and for, for all of us. God, help us to be the church in this time. Help us to be the church in this new year that our neighborhoods would say they're different. There's love there. There's truth there. There's hope there. May you be glorified in all that we do. And God, we ask, uh, I ask specifically, Father, that you would bless Crossroads Church and this family here, that you would give them boldness and courage and strength, and that you would 
Cover them with your protection and your power to be the gospel light here in Airway Heights and to bring hope to the neighborhoods that they, that they live in and that they work in. May you take all the glory, Lord, in your name. Amen. You are dismissed. I will not see you next week, but y'all can see each other next week, so come on back. <laughs>